Who are the most important people? What are the most important names in college football? That's a question I posed to you guys earlier today, and man, it's like opening a dam. We had like 15 million names come our way, and there were a lot of good ones. So I, I think, truth be told, we could do a series on this akin to the bold prediction segment, and we could go like 30 segments deep. We're too close to the season for that, but I am going to go through as many names as I can. I'm going to hit five tonight, and I told you, to me, pound for pound, one of the most important names in college football this year is Jim Knowles, and that is the new Ohio State defensive coordinator by way of Oklahoma State. Now, those of you who have watched Oklahoma State for a while, you know they had been largely the exception to the Big 12 rule. Oklahoma State was playing offense, but they also played really good defense out there, and man, it is needed in Columbus, Ohio. So, He's come in there, and this is really important. I kind of hinted at this the other day. Ryan Day knew what the problem was last year. Anyone with functioning eyeballs knew what the problem was the last couple of years. But they didn't have the solution on campus. And so Ryan Day knew after last season, I got to go outside of our walls to get the replacement. Here is why they needed that. If you're listening on podcast, we are showing on the screen the, the ineptitude of the Ohio State defense. And this is a place where largely you should be able to cherry pick your talent in recruiting. Now that's not exactly happening at the moment defensively for Ohio State, and we'll talk about that later in the show. But yards per game allowed, they were tied for 59th in the country last year. Points per game allowed, they were 38th in the country. On third down, in terms of percentage, they were 96th in the country. Red zone percentage, 88th in the country. Just inexcusable ineptitude uh, defensively. I think I may have said offensively a second ago. So defense has left a lot to be desired there. And if you think about it, if you're a Buckeye fan, you are literally wasting a championship offense because it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how thoroughly you skull drag a lot of the lesser Big Ten opponents up there. If you get to an Oregon matchup and what happened last year happens because you can't stop the run, if you get to the Michigan game and you get bullied along the lines of scrimmage, or if you make it all the way to the title game like you did a couple of years ago, but you cannot stop Alabama's passing game, it's really all for naught because the elevation of this program has been to a point now where it is national championships. Big Ten championships, it's national championships. Ryan Day himself said it at Big Ten Media Days the other day. Beat the team up north, i.e. Michigan to you and I. Win Big Ten championships, win national championships. He said we went 0 for 3 last year. A big reason for it was the defense. And so they went out and they got Jim Knowles. Here's the reason Jim Knowles is so important. For Ohio State, hey, if Ohio State's got a top 20 defense this year, there's only about two or three teams in the country that can beat them. None of them reside in the Big Ten. So if you told me off the bat, Ohio State's going to have a top 20 caliber defense this year, they win the Big Ten. Outside of crippling injuries, I mean like mass amounts of injuries offensively, they win the Big Ten. They're in a team that can touch them up there if they're playing that caliber defense. Then we're talking about what kind of Alabama do they face, or Georgia, or Clemson, one of these really loaded rosters. What kind of team do they play in the playoff? Because that's really what it would come down to. But if you have another year where those numbers look like we just showed on that graphic a little while ago, then all of a sudden we, we know two things. Number one, they're still going to be really good. They'll still be favored most of the way. But if they're sitting there you know, tied for 59th in yards per game allowed and their red zone numbers are in the 80s, they're probably getting towards the end of the season again. And they're probably losing at least one game that they're favored by a touchdown to double digits in. And then they're going to get smoked when they go up against a more fierce passing game in the playoff, or just a team that can dedicate themselves to running the ball at them. And then you'll have two things. Number one, you'll have a more wide open Big Ten maybe, and therefore a more wide open playoff field, because everyone has Ohio State penciled in to their, their four, their projected four. But the other thing you'll have is, I think you'll have the biggest indictment so far against Ryan Day. And if you've watched this show, you know I've taken criticism because I'm like sky high on Ryan Day. I think a lot of the criticism that gets lobbed the way of someone who's a first time head coach in this sport right now is insane. Kirby's dealt with it, Ryan Day's dealt with it, Lincoln Riley's dealt with it. I mean, these dudes are on the first go around and they're at Georgia and Oklahoma at the time and Ohio State respectively, but be that as it may, that's the way it works these days, I guess. But Ryan Day, you know, he went out and he got his replacement in Jim Knowles. And when he brought Jim Knowles in, he's given him the freedom to go get his staff. And, you know, you also need to be able to handle recruiting or you need to be able to at least cast enough vision to where we can carry it out on the recruiting trail and we know the players you want and we trust your evals, etc. If it doesn't immediately pay dividends, 
people start to look at Ryan Day. There is this whisper right now in college football that becomes a lot more just an outright yell of softness for Ohio State defensively if this year manifests the same kind of result we got last year. Jim Knowles is a very important name in college football this year, not just in Columbus, Ohio, but beyond. The next name, this is really easy, Quinn Ewers at Texas. Because Quinn Ewers at Texas, it's kind of like the version of Ohio State defense statistically. If I tell you nothing more about the Big 12 this year, other than Quinn Ewers is going to fulfill his star rating coming out of high school. He's going to live up to the hype that he had coming out of high school and then coming out of the transfer portal. What would you know about the Big 12? Well, you'd know Texas is going to be a very tough out. That's the first thing you'd know. It would not be a lock because they still have issues there. Offensive line is still an issue for Texas. You know, pass rush is still an issue for Texas. So unlike some of these places like Texas A&M, if we know they get good quarterback play this year, they could quite literally win a national championship with the rest of their roster. Texas is not there quite yet, but there wouldn't be, they wouldn't be far away. And they certainly would give themselves an opportunity to win every game in the Big 12 if they got high level, you know, A or A minus or better level quarterback play from Quinn Ewers. The other part of that is you will have validation I think, and maybe even vindication for Sark and the way that they aggressively went about things in the transfer portal. Also, that probably means Xavier Worthy's had a big year. Isaiah Nayer's had a big year. Maybe one or a couple of the Alabama transfers have had big years. It would just be certainly a win total in the eight-plus range. I don't see any way, if Quinn Ewers pans out this year, that they're not winning a minimum of eight games, could win 10. Like They could be up there in any kind of hunt, and that includes the Big 12 championship hunt. But the reason he's an important name is because there's a flip side to this. You know, right now, Texas is a co-favorite with Oklahoma to win the Big 12. They didn't come close last year because they, among other issues, had inconsistency at quarterback. They started multiple guys. Well, if that's the case again this year, if, if Quinn Ewers does start for them and it's just not working out, and he either just plays average as grits the whole year, or he's bad, and they have to replace him with Hudson Carb. And this is, of course, working off the premise that he'll win the job in the first place. If any of that happens, then the Big 12's wide open, or maybe it's Oklahoma's for the taking, or maybe it just opens really wide like it did last year, and a team like Baylor ends up coming up and snatching it again. But also, just think about the Texas world for a second. If Quinn Ewers doesn't work out, and we get two years in, to the Steve Sarkeesian era, and things don't really seem much better in year two than they were in year one, you know, I don't think I need to tell you how that's going to work out. I'm not talking about hot seat or a guy getting fired. I'm just talking about the, the crippling amounts of uncomfortability. The uncomfortability factor in Austin would ramp up tenfold. Most people there are willing to look at last year and say, it was what it was. We made a coaching change because we had a lot to fix. Well, if If five and seven means that we're fixing it, then so be it. It's a bitter pill to swallow, but we're willing to take that pill, just like you take some medicine you don't like because you know it ultimately makes you better. Well, if last year does not immediately start to make them feel better in terms of an on-field product this year, which Quinn Ewers is, I think, going to need to spearhead, it would be a problem. I don't know how big because I got to see the way the rest of the season plays out, but it would be a problem. Uh, The next one I want to do is I want to go to Fayetteville, Arkansas. Jaden Hazelwood, the wide receiver transfer from Oklahoma to Arkansas, he's a really big name this year. You know, I live in Nashville, and every day, if I listen to Buck Rising and the guys over doing local radio here, and uh, I listen to them talk about the Titans, all they're talking about is Traylon Burks. What kind of shape is Traylon Burks in? Could he, could he run a route today without being gassed? Well, last year, we saw him do it plenty because he was one of the best receivers in the country at Arkansas. Uh, the good news for the SEC West is he left. Kind of the different news for Arkansas is that he left and they have to replace him. It's not always bad news, it's just different news. Jaden Hazelwood transfers in from Oklahoma. This is a really big pickup for Arkansas. They're looking to fill that void. They're looking to fill that that thousand plus yard receiving production that Traylon Burks delivered them. Now it doesn't always have to happen with a single guy. You can make it up in the aggregate. They're gonna have one of, if not the best rushing attacks in college football again this year. But think back to the Arkansas-Texas A&M game last year. Arkansas ends up having the best rushing attack in the SEC. How did they win the game against A&M? Throwing the ball deep. That's how they won the game. 
against Texas A&M. Now, the stat sheet overall, if you looked at run to pass ratio, it was heavily tilted run. But the things, the plays that broke that game open were their ability to pop a couple of balls deep. That's all it needed to happen, as it turns out. Are they going to be able to do that this year? Because you see, Arkansas had some games like the A&M game last year where a couple of plays, being able to stretch the field, being able to scramble and throw the ball on the run, that was the difference. Do they have that capability? Do defenses have to respect the potential? Now, you may have Jaden Hazelwood in there, and that's the guy I'm talking about, but Keytron Jackson is on that team. Uh, like we talked to Sam Pittman a couple of weeks ago at Media Days, he said, if Malik Hornsby doesn't win this quarterback battle, and he won't, we got to find a way to get him on the field. Hornsby may be the fastest kid they have offensively, uh, but speed doesn't really mean anything if you can't carry out the other facets and craft of the position of wide receiver. Do they have that ability? You, do you have to respect their ability to go deep? You better. Otherwise, it's really going to bog down that offense. And I'm a believer that even with all those other names, for their offense to operate at maximum or peak efficiency this year, Hazelwood is an integral part of it. An integral part. That may mean he catches uh, a certain amount of balls for 800 yards. It may mean he goes for 1150, but he's got to be an integral part of it. Because I view him as sort of a, a foundational piece in that wide receiver room that everything else revolves around. So Jaden Hazelwood is another name, one of the most important in college football. Let's go all the way to the West Coast. Bo Nix, remember that name? I, you know, I, I sort of forget sometimes you and I are totally immersed in this sport all year. We do not believe in the O word. We don't even say the O word on the show. And if we have to, we whisper it. But unfortunately, there are some people out there who do take a break. Couldn't be us, but they do. I don't think some of that crowd knows that Bo Nix transferred to Oregon. You, believe it or not, there's some folks who are about to crack open a preview magazine or, or they'll be about to come back to our show. I mean, our audience will skyrocket over the next month. Watch and see what happens in August. And they'll look at this graphic and they'll say, stupid producer Jesse screwed another one up. No, he didn't. Not this time. Jesse does a good job. But um, yeah, that's Bo Nix, Oregon quarterback. Get used to saying it. He's important this year, you know, and he's important for a few reasons. Let's say on the positive side of things, let's say our glass is all the way full and Bo Nix just is a standout and he takes Oregon to the Pac-12 championship game. Well, what does that mean? It probably shines very well on Kenny Dillingham and that offensive staff out there, and that would be wonderful for them. But I'll tell you what else we could take away from that. We could look and we could say, hold on now, you're telling me that this dude goes 3,000 miles from home and all of a sudden he's a better quarterback than I ever saw him be at Auburn? What does that say about the team he played on last year and the staff he played for last year? Really, what would it say about Gus Malzahn and the staff he was playing for even before the last one came in? It was a whole lot of transition. Bo Nix's entire Auburn career was churn and transition and he did not play at any point in his career for a staff that is world-renowned for developing quarterbacks in-house. Malzahn's MO was going and getting them elsewhere. And he was trying to develop Bo Nix, and he got fired. Ultimately, that didn't work out. And last year was what last year was. Well, if he goes out to Oregon and he shines, it further validates the stereotypes that exist about a couple of those staffs in a lot of people's minds. Or, well, also, let me before I go to the or, also, Oregon could just win the Pac-12 if he's as good as everyone once believed that he was. Or, here's the downside, it doesn't pan out for him out there. Now, I don't think this would be a big deal for Oregon. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that a team kind of struggled and came up short in a coaching staff's first year. That wouldn't be that big a deal. Plus, you know they have Dante Moore coming in. Uh, we here, just internally, sort of kind of believe Dante Moore is the best quarterback in the country. Now, we're not on the rankings council. We may have five stars on our desk here, but we are not on the rankings council. So all I can do is text our recruiting guys and say, you need to bump Dante above Arch. They don't have to do it, but I just, I kind of, psst, psst. So if it happens, I want full credit, but if it doesn't happen, just know that I get ignored around here. But Dante Moore, number one quarterback, number two quarterback, whatever, he's coming into Oregon next year. Everyone knows that. Everyone's looking forward to that. So if Bo Nix doesn't work out this year, oh well. First year hiccup, we'll be better for it. You know how that song and dance goes. But also, if he doesn't work out this year, what does it do to the Pac-12? Because Oregon's right up there. I think Utah and USC are co-favorites. Oregon is close behind as the third favorite to win the conference out there. And that's, that's with a new quarterback and a new coaching staff, which shows you how wide open 
Vegas perceives the Pac-12 to be. There it is. Oregon is plus 300. Uh, Southern Cal and Utah are plus 210 co-favorites to win the Pac-12. Well, if Oregon is a three or four loss team this year, then maybe it is USC versus Utah. But let's just play that out for a second. What if one of those programs also trips up or doesn't live up to expectation? Well, all of a sudden, you could see a really unfamiliar name in that Pac-12 championship game. Could be one of the Arizona schools. I know it's tough to listen to that and imagine it. Uh, could be Washington out of nowhere. Certainly could be UCLA. So he's a very important name. Let me, let me go all the way across the country for one more name here. You, you very quickly see how I could spend all night just doing this segment. Devin Leary, the NC State quarterback, a very pivotal name. Most of you know him because he's been around forever, but Devin Leary, really important. Already had good numbers last year, a 35 to five touchdown to interception ratio through for over 3,400 yards last year. Despite 2021, I think it's safe to assume most people's default setting on the ACC is Clemson's the favorite until proven otherwise. The Vegas odds back that up. And so even if you doubt Clemson, like a lot of you may doubt them, but that's only part of the equation. You follow it up and say, okay, well, you may doubt them. Is there a team you trust more than them? And that's when the answers are few and far between. Some dude will say Pitt. Some dude over here will say Miami. Someone may say NC State. Maybe someone says North Carolina, probably me. But no one has a consensus on if not Clemson, then whoops. And uh, maybe it's NC State, is my point. Because my question to follow up will be, well, who can be better than Clemson? And the answer is NC State. You know, because this is a quarterback in Devin Leary that, unlike some of these other cats, does not get tasked with carrying his team. Good, solid, B-plus level quarterback play from Devin Leary could very well be good enough to win the conference because you know what kind of defense he's playing with. You know what kind of programs built around him. You know the kind of infrastructure that's around him. And let me also add this, not that I'm going to put on my quarterback evaluation hat anytime soon, but when we were out at Elite 11, Bryce was out there, C.J. Stroud was out there, uh, Leinert was out there one night, but he was out there too, Devin Leary. And I stood behind him for a good 10 minutes, standing next to Yogi Roth, good to meet Yogi, standing next to him watching Devin Leary throw. Devin Leary throws the ball exceptionally well. Now, granted, he was wearing shorts that night, and he was throwing to high school kids, uh, but he throws the ball well. And if you were watching him and you didn't know where he played, and I told you, hey, that dude, that, that guy plays for Bama. You know, that's, that's that Georgia quarterback that just won a title. Hey, that's that guy that's playing for Texas and puts up all those yards. If you didn't know any better, you'd say, yep, passes the eyeball test. Devin Leary, man, first off, he's well-built. And secondly, ball jumps out of his hand. But even if it didn't, even if he had average tools, he's got the kind of team around him to where if you want to use that moniker game manager, this is the time to do it. Devin Leary's got to manage himself a game, and in the process, they could just mess around and win the ACC. Uh, if they don't, you know, if Devin Leary doesn't pan out this year, NC State would fall off the radar, but could there be another team that pops up in the ACC? So those are five names. Jim Knowles, Quinn Ewers, Jaden Hazelwood, Bo Nix, Devin Leary. I, I can't stress how little a dent we put in the overall bag of names that you delivered. We could go all night and we will revisit that list.